Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming out on a rainy night to the third installment of the Wanderlust uh, School of Transgressive Placemaking. We're really excited to have you all here to help us reimagine and remake the far side of the No Trespassing sign. Tonight is site-specific experience design. And we're really grateful to Atlas Obscura for hosting this series. We're, uh, I'll bring up Dylan and Theris in just a moment. We're really grateful to uh, Acme Studio for this really awesome photo studio. Acme uh, is a full service photo studio if you need to uh, do any sort of crazy shenanigans that involve giant sets and taxidermy. This is the place for it. <laughs> And also Derby, who built this set and is manning the bar. Feel free to go make friends with Derby, he's awesome. Um, and now here's Dylan Thuris. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Dylan Thuris and uh, I'm the founder of a website called Atlas Obscura. Um, it's really nice to see you all here. A uh, little framing to look out into this giant sea of uh, would-be lawbreakers. Uh, so thanks for coming out on this rainy night. Uh, in case you don't know, Atlas Obscura is a, a website dedicated to uh, the world's hidden wonders. Uh, and we also do something called the Obscura Society. So in New York, LA, and San Francisco, we do ongoing events, real-world explorations with Atlas Obscura. Uh, as part of that, we, uh, we do uh, a residency with Nathan and Ida uh, as Wanderlust, and they put together this incredible talk series. Uh, the first two were about uh, judging safety and how to avoid killing yourself in going into places. Uh, the second one was about the legality, sort of a how legal is it, uh, you know, uh, talk on it's not <laughs> is, the, is the short answer, and this is uh, this is on the design. Once you're there, what are you going to do with the space? Uh, so I'm incredibly honored to introduce three guests that I am thrilled to be staring, sharing the stage with: uh, Jeff Stark, an uh, artist and uh, of nonsense in New York; uh, Charlie Todd, founder of Improv Everywhere. Nick Fortuno, a game designer and teacher of, what was the, what's your class name? It's Narrative Theory and Games? Is that, there it is. Uh, so I'm, uh, without further ado, I introduce these incredible speakers to talk to you about how to design incredible experiences and places. So, uh, um, so as you heard from Dylan, Dylan Thuris, uh, can you hear me? Is this better? Uh, as, as you heard from Dylan, um, I'm Ida, um, and uh, this is Nathan, we're Wanderlust. Um, so, so we're going to hear briefly from each speaker tonight, um, and then uh, engage in discussion. Um, Nathan and I will have some questions, we'll open it up to questions from you, so pay attention, take notes, and um, be sure to grill them. These, these folks are experts at, at this stuff, and we're excited to learn from them too. Also, we have an expert note taker who will be taking notes for those of you who are too lazy to take your own notes. And we'll be posting a kind of recap of key things online after we're done. We're also going to have a video of this, too, for those of you who fall asleep. Um, so now we'd like to um, give the podium over to Jeff. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Stark. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the ways to think about site-specific work and sort of break, break it down a little bit and, and look into um, the sort of different experiences that we create in places. How's my volume? Is it okay? In the back? Good. Okay. So, um, all right. That's a little warm. All right. So, I wanted to begin not just by talking about my work, but talking about some of the work that's been done in unusual spaces around this area, and then a little bit further afield. And one of the, the first projects that, that, that uh, really sort of uh, kind of opened up the way that I thought about space and what could be done in, 
in them was, was Gordon Mata Clark's splitting. How many people know this piece? About a third of the room, great. Gordon Mata Clark was um, a New York artist. He was one of the people who sort of created Soho. Created Soho as an artist space. He ran a restaurant uh, with a bunch of artists. He uh, went into places that he should not uh, be and cut giant holes in them to make sculptures. Now you find his work in the Whitney. Um, it's sort of like on a constant retrospective. This is one of his most well-known piece, pieces, which was called Splitting. And what he did was he found this house that was being demolished in New Jersey. He cut a line down the center of it with a sawzall and uh, jacked it up so that the house actually separated. And then he invited people to come in and look at the space and look at it as, it, look at it as an installation. And I always thought it was this sort of really fascinating take on the idea of how a house divided, but also uh, the, I, I imagine what it was like to, to be there. And in my reading, I read this quote, and, and uh, this painter, Susan Rothenberg, said, Gordon invited you into some very macabre participation. Being in that house made you feel like you were entering another state. Schizophrenia, the Earth's fragility, and full of wonder. It was so subtle at every level. And I thought, that's what I want to make. That's the kind of thing that I want to do. I want to bring people into a place where they can feel that kind of experience, something that's total and around you at all times. So I started looking at other kinds of work that was like that. And this is the person who really brought me into this world. This is Julia Solis. Um, she is the head of a, a group called uh, Dark Passage. She also publishes books as, as a photographer. And when I first came to New York, uh, I met Julia and a whole group of people around Dark Passage. And I was invited to come to a night, and the, the instructions were, wear a suit, meet us downtown, and you'll be done at the end of the night. And I walked into it, and it was a recreation of the film Dark Passage that took you on a sort of treasure hunt all throughout New York City, into hotels, into OTB betting centers, and it ended with a sit-down dinner for 40 people in a live subway tunnel. And I said, who the fuck are you people, and how can I do that? That's what I want to do. So I started hanging out around Julia and a lot of the collaborators, and looked at the kind of uh, experiences and the kinds of projects that they were designing. Um, it also took me a little bit further back, and uh, I started looking at other people who did this kind of stuff. And what we're talking about is theater that's specifically related to space. So this is um, Ka Mountain, which is a Robert Wilson piece that was done in Iran um, over uh, in, in 1974, I think. And um, it had 70 actors, um, it had camels, it had elephants, and it was all tied to the 72-hour piece on the top of a mountain. Um, this is Reza Abdo. Um, Reza was a, a, a New York City, before that Los Angeles director, who created pieces in abandoned hotels. He made a piece called um, Notes Toward a Conditional, or excuse me, um, Father Was a Peculiar Man in 1990, across the entire uh, meatpacking district. And what happened was you would go up to a car on the corner and you would buy a ticket and then you would sort of go into this space and for four blocks you could go in and out of all of the, the abandoned buildings and all of these sort of working storefronts and watch a narrative across, um, across uh, two or three hours and then it all culminated in a performance in the middle of the street. More contemporary, um, this is Snow Migration, which was a project done by Sarah McMillan. Um, it was a project that um, was tied not to a particular space exactly, but attached to a particular feeling. And what Sarah was trying to, trying to get was that feeling of being the first person to walk across snow. So she assembled this big group of people, and we had a huge plan, and the plan was on the night of the first snow, we're going to invite an audience that is, is going to be ready for the night of the first snow, and we'll all come in and go on a sort of nature hike following these characters through the woods, and the audience will be able to experience this sense of walking across the first snow. Here's another piece, another photograph of that. Um, this is another site-specific work. Um, this is Dead Horse Inn by Duke Riley. Um, Dead Horse Inn is under an overpass on Dead Horse Bay. Um, uh, Duke Riley 
is a fantastic artist and sculptor. And what he did was he collected driftwood, bottles, uh, garbage, junk, horseshoe crabs, and he built a, a, full, a full bar underneath this, this overpass and then invited people to come in for one night. And across one night, there was bare knuckle boxing. There was, um, you know, a, a sort of uh, a bonfires. There were um, drinks for a nickel. And, you know, it's, uh, all of these projects in, in a sort of way are, are artists inviting people to come and participate in these fantasies with them and sort of create their worlds. This is uh, the, uh, a very recent one done by people on this stage. Um, this is the Night Heron, which was uh, a speakeasy inside of a New York water tower. And it's a very specific kind of site-specific work, and, I, and I'm going to, to go into that in a second. So one of the people who's thought a lot about the kinds of work and the kinds of site-specific work that, that can be done is this artist named Robert Irwin. Um, Robert Irwin is known for doing these sort of massive ins installations in big name contemporary museums. Um, Irwin breaks it down into four kinds of work. Um, he's specifically talking about sculpture, but you can think about it in terms of performance. You can think about it in terms of, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of sculpture. And he's saying, one, they're site dominant work. That's like monuments, statues, murals. Uh, the work is dominant. Um, it doesn't take the site into consideration at all. They're site adjusted. So you make a work, you're putting it in the space, and let's say maybe you adjust the tilt to match a, match a hill in the background. Or if you make a mural, you sort of enlarge it to fit to one specific space. They're site specific, which is when sculpture is conceived with the site in mind. So now we're getting into what we're talking about in this room, where you're actually making a piece, a sculpture, a performance for one particular location. And then there's site-conditioned and site-determined work, which is sculpture response uh, drawn for reasons, draws its reason for being from its surroundings. It requires a process to begin with an intimate, hands-on reading of the site. So this is work that, that could not exist anywhere else. Um, it's, uh, one of the things I like to think about is maybe a site-specific piece, um, like uh, the Night Heron, um, uh, is, could exist in many different water towers. Um, a site condition or a site-determined piece can only exist in one place and no other. So I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of my projects and the way that I approach these ideas about site-specific work and site-responsive work. Um, the first is a project that I did a couple years ago called IRT. It was a play that took place on the New York City subway system. And one of the ways that, that I work, and a lot of people work, um, when we are trying to talk about site-specific or site-dominant work or site-responsive work, is I just begin by looking. And that's going into a space in a new way. I ride the subway every single day like you guys do, but when I really go and look as a scout, I'm looking for the things that are unusual, the things that catch my eye, the things that I think about how I can repurpose them. Um, this is a mural, and I thought, you know, what about the, the, the colors of this room are so beautiful? Um, here's a security camera, and that security camera feeds into that, um, that's, that security stand, and I can actually watch what happens on that camera within this booth. How could, it, how could we use that as part of a narrative? I'm also um, trying to think about uh, everything around uh, what I'm looking at. So I'm actually going into the history of the subway system. I'm reading about it. I'm trying to think about uh, the, what, what created the sound system. And I found this uh, story. This is a, a personal subway car called the Miniola. This is a subway car that was owned by one guy. And I thought, that guy is such an asshole. <laughs> What kind of person would, would, would own his own subway car? And so I decided to make a play around him. Um, this is a, was another part of the story. These are murals by Revs painted in the subway tunnels. And I, and I tried to think about you know, what kind of person paints, paints their own story on the subway walls. And the kind of looking that I'm talking about is not just being, but just consuming everything that there is to know a space, and then about a space, and then translating that into a show or into a work of art. So we did all of our uh, casting calls in subway stations and live spaces. 
We did all of our rehearsals actually in the subway stations. And then when we built the show, finally, we had sort of thought about every possibility of, of, of theater within a subway. So how could we completely transform the space? And we would use the tools of theater, which are lighting, which are costume, which are sets, which are backdrops. And we used all of these things to focus a story. So this is 40 people crammed into a subway, and what we're doing is we're meeting up at one station and then following the story on and off the trains as we're going up the line. So that you begin at um, the Borough Hall station, you follow the IRT all the way up to Harlem, and by the end of the night you've heard the whole story. Um, this is a film with the lead character. And um, this, is, this is the kind of site specific work that I really love. Um, and this is what happens when you work with great people, is that uh, the, the costume designers actually like made all of the dresses in this scene to match the colors on the, the subway wall. So you can kind of go as far with, with site specificity as, as, you, as you can go. And then by the end of the show, the way that we ended was by that original looking. So we were looking at different ways that I could use the space, right? So we put a character in front of one of those security cameras, and then we put the audience around the booth to sort of watch this sort of ghostly um, recording of the character as he said goodbye to the audience. Um, again, Irwin's conditions, and I'm going to just keep moving. Um, this is another piece. Um, this is, uh, again, um, going into, uh, what, what we do is we go into these unusual places and go into these spectacular places with the idea of, of creating site-specific work in mind. So I kind of think about it in the way that maybe an artist thinks about drawing, right? So an, a painter draws to keep their eye focused. They draw to keep looking. They draw to keep their, their, the, 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 their eye sharp. And that's what we do when we're going into spaces that we're not supposed to be or going into places to look around, is that we're going to think about the things that we might be able to do there. And so when I went into this space, which is in Yonkers, um, I hey, kind of tried to... Just a quick time check. Yeah. We're at like 14 minutes. Okay. And we'll finish in one more minute. <laughs> so um, so this, is, um, this is the Yonker space, and we went into this space, thought about the way that it looked sort of like a, an abandoned New York, and put it to a short story by Rick Moody about uh, living in a abandoned New York. So again, the looking adjusting a story to the conditions of an actual space, like not having stairs that you can travel up. Looking at a, a room full of materials and realizing that we don't actually need to bring any materials to the site, we can actually build with what's there. Doing the, the research and seeing what is the uh, intended uses for the, the space in the future. Um, and going in there with, with the whole crew and planning uh, what we're going to do and how it's going to work in that space. So this is actually using pieces found in the building. Using natural lighting uh, in this scene. Um, Jason Sinopoli, the lighting designer, because we couldn't use actual lights, he threw dust in front of the windows so that we would get those like really strong kind of glowing beams as they came in through the window. And so I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Next up, Nick Fortuna. I feel so lame. Over five days, and uh, the principle here was really about like 
like the idea that, that you were going to be thinking about the design of the city and how a city was made, and so we were leaning on monumental sculpture and, and you know, Goldenberg's ideas that monumental sculpture is all about scale, to sort of think about like, well, what would it be if you had to move this three-story thing through a city, and what would be the constraints, and how would you navigate those constraints? Um, I, I've done like sort of dance performance game pieces. This is human on asteroids. Um, that's what it looks like in the dark. Uh, it's uh, basically a human version of asteroids. Um, I did this with Sam Strick, and this was designed for the Lyceum space in Park Slope, um, which was this was really just an excuse for me to, to put dance to work in games. And I also co-run a festival called Come Out and Play with Greg Treffry. Uh, this has run for about eight years, and we've done sort of site-specific game work all over the city, including in the Lower East Side, Times Square. Um, Park Slope, uh, and most recently Governor's Island and South Street Seaport. And this is a curated festival of about 30 games a year. Um, I've made games for it, and Greg has made games for it every year, but we also host games made by many, many people around the world. And when we pick the games that we pick, we often pick them specifically because of some of their site specificity. So the idea that you're actually designing a game that's going to be played in space is thinking a large part about that experience. Uh, but I also do live action role playing games, which is basically like interactive theater with no the audience. Um, so this is uh, this is a piece I made when a friend of mine told me that we could rent a hotel room that looked like a train car, and I tried to think of what I would do in a train car, and I made an existential horror lark, which means like a live action role playing game designed to instill existential horror in players. Um, that's why everyone's in black. Uh, and, uh, and I've also done this in a more positive way. This is uh, a LARP I did for my friend so he could propose to his girlfriend called the Measure for Marriage. Um, this is the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, and that is Rose Month, which is why there are roses everywhere. Um, when I designed this, I told Craig I wanted to put big, big cards over everything. Um, so what holds these things in common, I think, is the idea that they're about play. And, and the reason why that's like important to me is because they're they're nonlinear experiences, and so <clears throat> I'm not particularly interested in having someone go to a space and hear my story because I don't think my story is that interesting. Um, what I want is for players to make their own way through. And when you approach a design of experience like that, then really what you're asking the players to do is, is to make the experience for themselves. So your job isn't to dictate that experience. Your job is to guide people through the experience. You're, you have to guide them because otherwise you just brought them to the space and dropped them there. Then you're basically saying that like the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens is cool, or this abandoned warehouse is cool, or the subway station is cool, and they didn't need you for anything. Well, you didn't show it to them. So what you're trying to do is give them an experience, but it's a really experience that they make. And what that means is that they have to be able to explore it. So if you're trying to design something that's going to actually have the players at the center of the experience, or the viewers at the center of the experience, then you have to think about it as a, as a design of exploration. Like, how do you actually design someone's exploration? And if you, but if you can do that, they can make their own experiences. So every person who comes into this will have their own experience, and that's what can make that kind of work powerful. So, what I want to spend the rest of this talking about, just very briefly, is some of the I think some of the principles behind this design that I use to kind of keep that that focus at the center. You know, like how this can kind of be exploration as an activity. <coughs> The first is, you don't use scripts, you use rules. There's a subtle difference here, but it's really important. You are never telling people what to do. You are telling them what not to do. Because what to do is the space they define. So this is actually a sheet from Measure for Marriage. It was a rules of etiquette for nobles, which was one half of the player base. And it basically tells nobles what they can't do. So there's people they can't talk to, there's things they can't talk about, there's ways they have to talk because they can't talk any other way. And, and all that does is really define the spaces they can't go. Um, and the, the reason for that is because I don't want to define the, define the spaces they can go. I want them to find the spaces they can go. So I give them limits, and then I just tell them to play. And I let them find whatever they find in that space. Now I define the limits, so I know what they'll find, for the most part. <laughs> right? So it's not like I didn't know that they would come across certain kind of strategies or find certain objects. But I didn't tell them that up front. So when they found it, they felt like they found it themselves. Right? And I think that's, that's the difference that I was kind of thinking from a rules perspective rather than a script perspective. Um, a principle of doing this correctly is the idea of small asks. This is a con trick, by the way. That's where the term comes from. Is that if you want to get someone to do something, you give them a small ask first. So you get them to sort of cooperate with you in some small way, and then you can ask for something big. So if you want to ask, 
someone in your life for a thousand dollars, you should first ask them for a dollar because they will be more inclined to give you the other thing. This is a this is a sketch of a piece by Dan Graham, who's one of my favorite interactive artists. And the way it works is that you stand in front of a mirror and there's a camera there, and then what shows on the screen is is a reflection of you, but it's delayed by like ten seconds. So in case this kind of surreal landscape where you think you're looking at a mirror, but actually there's a delay on your action. And when you see that delay, you sort of have already become engaged because you moved. And by moving, you were already participating in the experience. So by the time you see that reflection delayed, you've already engaged and you've already seen yourself engaged and you've already become intrigued. So the piece didn't have to ask you to interact. It just let you do whatever you did and then made something curious happen that got you involved. Right? That's like the most small ask I can imagine. And I think that's, that, that can be really strong. So giving people complex rules when you design something is very dangerous. Um, because if they get confused, there's a look on a player's face that you'll see that's sort of like, like that. And when you get that, it means you fail. Because now they kind of detach from you and are trying to figure out what you're saying. And now they're wondering if this is worth their time at all. So the smaller you can make the asks for what you're asking people to do, the more easily it is to get them involved, and it makes a better experience for everybody. Uh, if you're not going to tell people what to do, you need to give them some kind of signs. Um, and so this is just a miniature golf course I found online. And what I really <laughs> like is you can see, you can see the flag for the next hole from where you're standing, right? So when you finish this hole, no one has to tell you where to go. You just see it. And this is a principle of design that's been used to great effect in a lot of scenarios, but probably the best scenario is in, um, in the Disney theme parks. They're actually very, very good at this. And there's a lot of literature about the design of Disney rides specifically for the purpose of guiding people without telling them anything. There's actually a wonderful article in the Game Design Reader about the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and how it was designed so that you could let players steer their own ships and not tell them anything, but make sure they saw all the cool stuff. And it was basically by firing off flares in the lane. Because if you're staring at an empty pool of water with nothing on the horizon and then the light goes off, you'll probably go to the <laughs> um, A wonderful thing about playing in real space is that you actually people are embodied. Um, and the body of a player is actually a very powerful object that you can use. Because we are completely unconscious about the way our bodies affect our emotions. And studying the psychology of this reveals like wonderful tricks. <coughs> this was a haunted house run in a penitentiary in the south. And I picked this image out because you can see this is like super bright light right behind the right behind the guy as he's coming forward into the shadows. That light is there to, to just eradicate his night vision. And if you've ever been in a haunted house, they almost always have a strobe light that goes off in an irregular effect every so often. And the every so often is just long enough for your night vision to have resettled. Um, because the haunted house wants to keep things in the dark for you. But they can't really make it that dark or you would never be able to navigate it. So, what they don't want is for your night vision to settle. And the way you make someone's night vision break is you flash a bright light in their face. Um, there's lots of techniques like this. Um, the Night Heron actually used one, which I thought was really fascinating. There's a moment in the early part of the Night Heron where you have to cross over a gap. Um, and the drop is big enough that it would hurt you, but the jump is not really that big. You're going to make it, and there's someone there to help you because you won't fall. But when you make that jump, your adrenaline kicks in because you could fall. And that makes you nervous. And then you're nervous for the whole trip up because your adrenaline doesn't go away that fast, even though you think it does. It takes like, like 10 minutes is not enough time to get that out of your system. So by the time you get up to the roof, you're still nervous, even if you don't feel it. And so when you come into a space that's safe, the relief you feel is much stronger, but you don't recognize that happened because you made a jump 10 minutes early. And there's tons of that stuff. <laughs> And then finally, I think that there's a role for technology in all this, but the really key thing is that it's reliable. These are NFC tags. Um, this is this, the single best technology for this stuff that's coming um, because everyone's phone will be able to do this soon because they want you to pay bills this way. Um, but you can use these tags for anything. And the nice thing is they just work. If you bring a phone that's NFC enabled up to an NFC tag, it just works. I think the difficulty that we have in technology is that technology is klutzy and unreliable. But if we get reliable technology, that that technology can be like magic. So if you're thinking about using technology in a piece, the most important thing about that technology is that it works every single time without fail. That is much more important than the technology being cool or doing what you want. If the technology doesn't work, it's just broken, and it will ruin your experience. So, I mean, the short answer is that if you're interested in looking at this from a more game-like perspective, 
um, whether that's game-like narrative or game-like play, uh, the key thing is to think about it as exploration. The users explore, but they don't explore on their own. That's not a designed experience. You guide their explorations. You do that by making interactions simple, intuitive, and reliable. They know what to do, it's very simple to understand what to do, and it works when they do it. And that creates rules that they can follow and adhere to. And if you design it that way, then you can make sure that every user has a unique experience. Charlie Todd. Hey, everybody. Uh, hey. So, uh, I'm going to talk about um, some of the product owners, site, more, more site specific oriented projects, um, uh, all of them unauthorized. Um, Jeff showed a lot of projects that were in like really cool, abandoned, awesome, amazing spaces. And, um, and Prop Everywhere is more about doing something extraordinary in a place that is very important. Um, so, these locations will be publicly accessible, but projects are, are unauthorized. This is the very first No Pants Subway Run. You might have heard of the No Pants Subway Run as it's gotten huge and ridiculous and more like a parade. But the very first year in 2002, it was very much a secret prank. Uh, I had no idea how it was going to go. This is on the sixth train. These are two Danish guys that sit down next to the cameraman. I think the camera's just like a mini TV camera in someone's lap with a magazine on top of it. And that's me right there in a brown coat. It's winter time. It's January. I'm not wearing pants. This woman will notice me right here. <laughs> 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 now I so she noticed me uh, and goes back to reading her book, which is titled Rape. <laughs> it's actually a book about China. But uh, in, New York City, in New York City, as we all know, uh, one, one weirdo on a train is not actually that weird, right? Uh, you're, you're able to just uh, ignore it and say, well, that's a weirdo, it's 32 degrees outside, it's January, but whatever, this guy's in ladybug boxer shorts, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore him. Um, so what she does not know is that on the subway platform at the next six consecutive stops, I have friends who are also in their underwear and winter coats and scarves who are going to be entering this exact same car. So this is stop number two. <laughs> stops, a total of seven guys get on the train in their underwear. We all act like we don't know each other, we're, you know, listening to music, reading magazines, looking at the subway map. Um, on the eighth stop, a girl got on with a duffel bag full of pants, um, like she was someone selling peanut M&Ms for her basketball team or something. Uh, we all bought a pair of pants for a dollar, put them on, and then exited the train in different directions. So we just got really lucky with that video. I didn't know what I was doing. I was 22 years old. I moved here six months prior, but we fortunately just had the camera pointed at the exact right person that gave us this amazing um, re reaction, and it inspired me to do the No Pants Up. We were in the next year, we had like 15 people, and then we had 30 people, and this past year, we had 4,000 people, and it was in 60 other countries, or 60 other cities, of about 25 countries. So it's kind of gotten completely out of control. Um, but we, you know, the, the intent is still the same, which is to give somebody else a great experience in a place where they're not expecting uh, to be entertained in any way. 
So way back in 2002, I started doing these projects all over the city. I held an offshore gambling <laughs> ring in the Lake Central Park. <laughs> so we went to the boat and uh, snuck on a uh, table and played blackjack with people in other boats. Um, I put a bathroom attendant in the Times Square McDonald's. I was at the Diver Change Station, uh, putting amenities on it. Uh, the manager tried to kick us out, but it was a Sunday. And my guy just said that he'd been sent there by corporate. And the manager, manager went to call the corporate office and no one answered because it was a Sunday. So I stayed for a while longer and then packed up and left. I put a suicide jumper on a three foot tall ledge. Uh, and this is a good example of a, of a location inspiring uh, uh, the event. And Jeff talked about you know, the nature of, of something being site specific. And this idea came to me because I live in this neighborhood. It's over near Madison Square Garden. I was walking by one day on my way to lunch and I saw this three foot tall ledge. I thought it was funny. I stood on it and then realized it would be really funny to put a suicide jumper there. Um, I also had Anton Chekhov give a lecture at Barnes & Noble. Uh, this was without the permission of Barnes & Noble, Union Square Barnes & Noble, up on the fourth floor. Uh, we put up posters all over the uh, Meet the Writers area with my friend John's face on it, and then he got up there and read from the cherry orchard. The manager asked us to leave after about 20 minutes and said that we were welcome to come back when Mr. Chekhov wrote a new play. <laughs> This was the first large-scale project in Provador I ever did back in 2005. Um, you might know this building on 14th Street across from Union Square. Uh, it's now a Burlington Coke factory. It used to be a five minutes basement. This is just a few months after it opened. I was walking through Union Square Park, and I saw a girl dancing in Forever 21 and in the window. And it was really weird because it was nighttime. She was backlit, just like this photo. And I couldn't figure out why she was doing it. It lasted 10 seconds. And then her friend gave her a hug, and they walked away. It seemed like her friend had dared her to dance in the window because you're very much on stage at those windows uh, in front of the Square Park. So I saw that and decided, well, the logical next step is to have someone in every single window. So this is a project called Look Up. And this is February 2005. Everybody dressed in black arrived one by one in the three different stores. And I'm giving hand signals in the park to advance the actions from one to the other. People are holding up three foot tall letters that read, look up more, and find this basement there. And then I give the next hand signal, and everyone does jumping jacks at the same time. Kind of barely make out there, um, and then everyone danced. Uh, everyone danced, and then we had one person dance, did a dance solo in the corner. <laughs> so everyone is pointing at that one guy based on where they are, um, and they did a variety of other activities, jumping up and down, dropping to the ground, and we ended up having a very real audience for the project, uh, which was just people who were getting off the subway, who stopped and ended up giving us a round of applause um, at the end of it. Um, and that shows the letters a little bit better. Um, it was three different retail stores. I had spent a lot of time researching it. Uh, you know, again, as Jeff talked about, visiting the space, thinking about the space, figuring out what I could get away with, uh, where the registers were, where the security guards were, you know, where the, like, the sensitive places might be. Um, and I was curious to see what the responses would be from the stores. Uh, Forever 21 didn't notice anything happened in the store. <laughs> uh, Alien's basement paid for the manager, but he didn't, he didn't show up. Uh, and DSW had a complete and total meltdown and physically removed our participants. Um, and in fact, it was after the jumping jack started that the security guard shouted at them, no jumping jacks allowed in the store. <laughs> But also, I felt bad for the guy who probably never dealt with 15 people dressed in black staring out his windows and doing jumping jacks. Um, this is a project we did in the Best Buy, another retail project. Um, I got the idea. I actually emailed to me from a stranger of bringing people with blue polo shirts and khaki pants into a Best Buy. Um, this is uh, the Best Buy in Chelsea, which was the only, the only Best Buy in Manhattan in 2006 when we did this. Uh, people of all ages participated, uh, young people, this guy was 65. Uh, and I told the participants, don't say that you work there, uh, but don't shop either, just sort of stand around. Uh, if you're in a retail store and you're not actively shopping, you look like an employee. Obviously, you really look like an employee if you're wearing their uniform. So anyone in the video that doesn't have a yellow name tag on their shirt is one of our participants. Uh, most of the employees thought it was really funny. A lot of them took pictures with us. A lot of them made jokes about asking us to deliver heavy television sets. <laughs> 
food was pretty good until the managers and the security guards got involved. And you can see them in the yellow shirts and the uh, black shirts in this video. Was one guy. Um, they ended up dialing 911. <laughs> so after about 20 minutes, the police arrived. You see the NYPD there. Um, and assessed the situation, talked to the management, caught one of my camera guys, and eventually had to tell the managers it was not illegal to wear a blue polo shirt. <laughs> that he'd never caught was the guy that just went in with a blank mini DVD tape, put it in uh, one of Best Buy's own oh, wow. lamps that was for sale in the other camera area and just pretended to be demoing a camera. <laughs> just walked right out with his tape. Uh, I'm going to show one more quick project. This, uh, I had to make this commute. You guys might be familiar with this transfer point, which is where the 6 train meets the E train. Um, I had to make it one morning, or in the middle of winter, going to a meeting, and it was miserable. Long line of people waiting to get up these escalators, and no one was happy. So I wanted to, to stay something here that would be positive and fun. Um, so this was uh, winter 2009, 8.30 in the morning. It was a Monday morning. General, you know, people coming in from Queens on their way to work, not in the best mood at that time, on that day, with that kind of weather outside. facing 20 chairs, and it looked like it, there needed to be a boardroom meeting there. So I had one. I had my friend Will Hines go and purchase a whiteboard and a, an easel from the Staples, and then instead of leaving the store, go and set it up and give a presentation. And this guy in the upper right-hand corner there with the long sleeves, he's the manager, and he was just sort of staring on. He was in a stupor for a while, and then interrupted, and uh, ultimately, uh, my friend Will just said, well, we booked this room with Carol, so I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Check with Carol, we booked the room. I was convinced that we thought we were, we were supposed to be in the office building upstairs, and we just went through the wrong door. <laughs> That's sort of another thing that I've learned over the years, is that if you dress nice, and if you're older, and all of these participants were between, between 50 years old and 78 years old. Look, I was 78. So I've learned, you know, it's harder, it's easy to get thrown out of a store if you're just a teenager or a college kid, you know, goofing off in a Walmart. But, you know, if you bring 
40 people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad to know how to kick you out. And then finally, this is a super recent project I did uh, called Talk Show Subway Car, uh, <laughs> similar to, to Jeff's elaborate um, project that he did in the train. Uh, we had a, a talk show in the subway, uh, late night talk show in the subway, the end train really late at night, and they, they, the guests uh, were just random people on the train. Was, uh, the next guest of the show is the woman in the pink shirt. <laughs> Uh, we interviewed uh, real viewers. So that's all my It's, a, it's such a great captive audience. I mean, the, your audience won't leave you. They're, they're, sort, of, they're sort of stuck. <laughs> um, you know, if you're doing something in a park or another public space, it's, people can ignore you. If you're doing something in the subway, people can switch cars. And I try to design things where it's not confrontational. If you don't want to participate, you can sit and read your magazine or read your iPhone or whatever, and we're not going to bother you. But if you do want to participate, it's right there right in front of you. And um, for me, in the in the winter, the, the subway is one of the only you know protected warm spaces. So uh, you can't really work outside or in abandoned spaces. But um, you know the the subway is relatively sheltered, so it was useful. What about, what about you, Nick? You also did something with the subway. Oh, uh, it's a it's a claustrophobic box. <laughs> right, it's like so small. I mean, when we did when we did Ghost Engines, I put thirty people in one of those things, and like it just they meant there was no room for anyone to move, and so it was really useful for that. But the best actually thing I saw on the subway was a game that ran come out and play something years ago called Singles on the S. And the way it worked is that players would have the players would divide into two teams that were on opposite sides of the S train, and they would have to send a signal to the people on the other side of the kinds of people they were looking for by giving them bracelets. So you had to convince strangers who looked like the kind of person you were trying to get your team to identify to wear a bracelet and then ride the subway across. And then when they got off, the, your team members would be on the side, other side checking them off. Um, and I love that piece because it was about that kind of participation, like how do you actually get random strangers to participate? We were really nervous about running that because we don't usually assault people on the street. Um, but it worked really beautifully because it, the, ask, the ask was really simple just to wear this, this bracelet. So. Cool. I, I love the subway too. Uh, <laughs> it's also there's good turnover because it's a captive audience, but every minute, you know, you're getting new people who are walking in and reacting to it for the first time. Um, I uh, was curious about something that each of you kind of um, poked at a tiny bit, but I would love a, a more in-depth answer, um, which is uh, how do you? Um, how do, you, how do you know if uh, a rule is simple? Um, Nick talks specifically about rules. Some of you don't specifically talk about rules, but you, you are all bringing people into places where there's very complicated things happening, and you have to tell people how to behave in public or in wherever. How, how do you, how do you like, give people instructions like that to keep it simple? Well, I, I usually, with the sort of massive participation things I do, I just try to make it as simple as possible and just have it be like one thing. Like, we're gonna go into Grand Central and we're going to freeze in place. And, that, and that's it, you're not, you're not gonna forget that. Or you're gonna ride the train and you're gonna take your pants off. You know, so <laughs> these projects where like, I'm getting literally just anyone off the street who's on my mailing list who wants to volunteer, I just try to make them as sort of one objective that can't go wrong. And if one person, also if one person does it wrong, it doesn't matter. You know, if one guy's not frozen in place in Grand Central, then he just looks like he's not a part of it. Um, I do really complex instructions by email and with repetition, and so I sort of keep telling people again and again at, at many stages. And then uh, once we're on site or we're getting ready to do something, I limit it and I have a rule that, that I will only give a person three pieces of information once they're on site because they're going to forget anything else. So I like one, that's even better. But, um, but I, you know, I think three is good. Like, uh, 
make sure that you look under, uh, look where you're stepping every single step. That's a good rule, That's something that you want to tell people on site. Um, make sure to always stay with your buddy. That would be another like good site rule. I try to limit it to three. Though. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's basically the same thing. Co like complex instructions up front, you rehearse a ton, so everybody's memorized them. Don't change anything because anything you change will be forgotten immediately. And stuff on site. I mean, it, you have to be. It's, I think another way to think about simplicity is to think about gestalt, right? Like things that are general and comprehensible in a general way are good. Things that are special casey and specific are bad, right? So if you can get someone to basically understand what they're supposed to do then anything else you tell them will make sense on that frame and it will kind of be comprehensible. It's like, your, your job is to stand still, right? Okay, got it. While standing still, you can maybe whistle, right? Like, they already know they're supposed to stand still. That makes sense to them. Adding on to that as long as it doesn't violate what they were already expecting is pretty easy. So you kind of want to think from like top down, right? Like, most general and more important, and then more specific as you go, and then as, as you both said, if they forget something at the bottom, it doesn't really matter. Like, they got the main point up front. Um, uh, I think I'm most struck by how different all of you approach site-specific. Um, for Jeff, at least the works that you presented, um, a, a site offers an unusual stage. Um, for Charlie, it's an automatic audience. Um, and for Nick, it's a space for exploration. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up to the audience for, for questions. Um, there's a really wide variety of approaches to site-specific work um, and engaging people in that space. So who wants to start off? There's somebody extremely enthusiastic in the very back. Hello. Um, I'm very interested in these types of events, and I've been uh, involved in a number of them. Whenever I see events that are very resource intensive, like with uh, costumes, costume designers, sets, actors, props, I always wonder if they are monetized in some way, if you charge for them, and if not, how do you uh, get the funds in order to have 30 actors and costumes and sets and things like that? So just quickly to summarize, um, uh, the, the question is about the economics of this. Um, are you charging money for things? Um, if not, where, where do the funds come from? Yeah, so I'm really into charging money for stuff. Um, I um, I think that that um, you know we, I participate in culture. Um, we all participate in culture, and I think that we should be paying for that. I think that when we are not paying for culture, you, we're usually participating in marketing, um, and I prefer to participate in culture. So I charge what I think is a fair amount for my events, and I use that money to pay for the event. Um, I try to always pay actors um, a very small amount, but I pay. And um, I try to give people budgets to work with, um, and it tends to be a small amount. But uh, there's definitely nothing sort of sustainable in the, in the realm of like, are we really paying ourselves what we're worth? But we're definitely like supporting the event and supporting the piece itself. So um, I tend to, so when I work, I work always in collaboration, and I tend to work with big groups of people. And um, one of the things that sort of helps out uh, the, the finances and the economics of that is to, to use an open book policy um, so that everybody kind of knows where the money is going. So if there's like a $20 ticket, for example, um, everybody knows that like, you know, 5% is going to actors, 10% is going to sets, you know, and it, and it sort of breaks down that way. Just so everybody can see where the money is going, that tends to help a little bit. Have you ever paid a location fee? It's <laughs> like a trick question. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what's a location fee? <laughs> next, next, next question. Next, Tyler? Oh yeah, um, so I mean, my project is a little different because uh, I mean, they're they're always free of charge to participate in, and in many ways, I feel, you know, if money should be going in any direction, it's actually paying the people who are, who are coming and being a part of it, um, because you know, they're the, my participants sort of are my actors in that way, rather than just being someone. Even though it's an enjoyable experience, you know, they're helping me create something rather than just enjoying something that I created. I don't really have a traditional audience that would make sense for them to. Pay an admission price, since the, the audience really is the actors. 
Um, in terms of the economics and funding and stuff, I mean, I, I have a popular YouTube channel, um, and I have, I'm in the YouTube Partner Program, and I do run advertising against the videos, so the annoying pre-roll ads that, you know, drive you crazy or make you install an ad blocker. Um, you know, at, it's not a lot of money, but it is enough money that helps me cover the cost of the products. I, I, I'm an idiot, and I don't charge for anything. <laughs> uh, we've never charged for come out and play, because we decided that we didn't want to. We felt like we'd be beholden to a lot of people if we did, and it would just make, we'd have to deal with it, and we just didn't want to deal with it, so we just pay for it out of pocket. But I guess I've decided that my retirement will be vague memories of crazy stuff. <laughs> And, and uh, as Wanderlust, we like to give uh, we like to give gifts. So we like our experiences to be gifts. And when something's a gift, we definitely don't charge money for it. Um. Not that those two things necessarily have to be in conflict: charging a ticket price and approaching your work as a gift. Um, but yeah, it's the gift gift economies and charging ticket prices. It's an, it's an interesting tension. Um, uh, Next question. Um, I'm curious to ask, what, in your own words, what makes your experience as a transgressor? And I was interested in the legal aspects of it, and the social aspects of what impression you think of crossing the boundaries of the So the question is, what makes um, your work transgressive? Not necessarily legally, but perhaps around social boundaries. In uh, in the election of 2004, when Kerry and Bush were touring the country, um, they created free speech zones, um, which were cordoned off areas where you could protest if you wanted to protest. Um, and I thought that was the most outrageous thing I had ever heard, um, because like the country is a free speech zone. And at the time, there was all this discussion of privacy, um, as as you know, like we have these rights to privacy, which we frankly don't. I mean, there's no constitutional right for privacy, but there is very strictly a constitutional right to publicity. It's called the right to assembly. We have a right to assemble in public for public grievances. And so every piece of work I've ever done, in the back of my head, I'm thinking about assembly rights because I realize that protesting assembly rights is, is just ridiculous. Like, because you protest by being in public. So all you really need to do is be in public. If you just get a whole bunch of people doing something crazy in public, you are automatically protesting assembly rights. So I feel like the transgressiveness that I like to explore in my work is simply the, the, the weirdly transgressive notion that we have a right to do things in public if we don't break it and we don't hurt people. And so every piece I do in public is really just a reinforcement of the Dadaist notion that the public's face is ours. Yeah, that's pretty much my answer 100% as well. I mean, I think the, you know, there is no real point to improv everywhere. I come from a comedy background. I'm doing things because they make me laugh. And, but, but ultimately, like, the point that exists is that public space should, we as citizens should have the right to express ourselves creatively in public space, and we should not have to go through a, a permit process and an approval process with the community board as long as we're not doing any, any damage and we're not harming anyone up, anyone or getting in anyone's way. So, I, you know, to me, the transgressive act is just not asking for permission and not asking for permission to, to create. Um, whether it's in public or in private, just, you know, I, 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 when I, I give talks at schools a lot, and just the message I always try to give to like young college kids is like, don't wait for your big break. Go create your own big break. Whether that's, you know, you're a musician, you know, don't wait for a record label, don't wait for somebody to buy your film script or whatever. Like, don't, don't hope that you get, a, even a Kickstarter, don't hope that you can raise the money. Just figure out a way to go do it. Um, and I think that just, Creating it on your own terms without asking for permission is is transgressing, I guess. And I like to go. I like to trespass. I like to go places that I'm not supposed to go because some of them are amazing, and uh, some of those places are amazing. And I like to take people there. And one of the reasons why I like to take people there um, is because I like to get an audience to participate in in risk. I like an audience to 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 invest in a project and invest in being an audience. Um, you know, as a, as a New Yorker uh, and, and a person who's interested in culture, I, I constantly am going out, I go to see shows, I, I, you know, I go to see my friends work, and, and so often my level of participation is reduced to uh, buying a ticket. Um, when I'm doing a, a more transgressive project, what I'm asking you to do is come and trespass with me. Come and break this law together. We're all going to do it. And, um, and something happens when an audience does that. Um, they become more alert, they become more aware of their surroundings, they become uh, aware of their own complicity 
as a, as a, as a member of, of an audience. And they become aware of their own role in, in the creative act. And in any creative act, it's an audience that completes it. It's that circle. And so participating in risk allows a, an audience member to sort of uh, understand their uh, role in, in the creative act. And, and for me, that's, that's an important part of the transcripts. Next question right here. A lot of these sorts of things happen exactly once or in ways that cannot be experienced again, even when sometimes they run more than once. Could you talk about the value of things that people know that they'll only be able to experience a single time? I uh, have someone who just ran the 12th annual no pants up your <laughs> Guilty of not always uh, doing that. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is part of the part of the excitement of, especially from like of the perspective of producing it. Isn't it products where you know you have one shot. Like we're going to go into the staples and we're probably going to get kicked out, and we have one shot to do this right. And if we come back tomorrow, we're just assholes. So yeah. we're not going to come back. So to me, Unfortunately, like, I unfortunately there are no more staples besides this one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the question is, um, for site-specific work, what does the rehearsal process look like? Um, if you can get into the space, you work in the space, which you often can't. And, and the problem with a lot of this stuff is that it has scale, and scale is impossible to test. That's, that's like really the nightmare, even more, I think, than the access. It's like, if you run a game for 200 people, you don't usually have 200 people hanging around waiting to do stuff for you. You're going to get them that one time, and then they're gone. So. God, how do you rehearse? Well, you train the people, right? The NPCs, you just drill them until they won't come anymore. Um, because as an NPC? Yes, as an NPC. Can, can you explain what Oh, a non-player non character, a shell, a, you know, someone who's working for you. Sorry, I'm in my game head. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, like, you train those people a lot because you got to make sure that they're reliable, but then you kind of, you do these small-scale experiments where you just make sure that, like, like the, the core of what you're doing can work. You, like, test the core of it in isolated spaces. And when I do public work, I always do that in public. Just like I, I agree with your rehearsal technique because it's completely different when it's in private. Um, but that's that's where it's transient again. You just roll the dice at a certain point because you just you can't know. And when we do come out and play, you know, at a certain point, we just roll the dice on thirty things every year because no one knows if any of that stuff is actually going to work. Um, but you get a feel after doing it for a while when you look at small scale things if it's going to scale right. And so I think just just trying it a lot is the best way to get a sense of how you know how things are going to go from big small to big. Yeah, I, I do some beta testing sometimes, like for my um, MP3 experiment project, where everyone's listening to the same instructions on headphones. We're getting ready to do a new one on July 14th at the Seaport, and probably a couple of weeks beforehand, when we have the script ready and the MP3 tracks ready, I'll get 10 friends to go do it, and I'll learn a lot just from watching 10 people do it. And on that day, it'll be a few thousand people who will do it, but. I'll know if we made any mistakes if my 10 friends do it wrong or do it the way that I didn't think that they were going to. Next question. Rebecca. Charlie, now that your events are famous, have you ever heard back from that first woman on the subway with the rainbow? <laughs> yes. Uh, so the question was, have I ever heard from the first woman on the subway in the video that I showed you guys? So that was in 2002, and that video was just on a mini DV tape that I would show my friends when they came to my house, because that was the only way you could watch a video like that. Um, and then in 2006, YouTube came around, I joined YouTube, and in 2007, I got around to putting that video on YouTube. And within, like, a day, uh, she left a comment on, the, on my site and said, oh my god, my coworker just sent this video to me and asked, is this you? Yes, it is me. I've always wondered what this was. <laughs> and her name was Kate, and she was my, I'd always wondered who she was, because like, she looked like she was like my age, and um, turned out she worked at, I think, uh, Penguin Publishing, which a friend of mine worked there, like three cubes down from her, but anyway, um, she's super nice. We, we did a, a documentary about Improv Everywhere that's gonna be released soon, and we interviewed her for it, and she's awesome, and um, sort of, she confirmed what I hoped, which was that she enjoyed it, and then it was a story that she had kind of constantly told over the years, which was the purpose of the project. So that was exciting. You here with the short one? 
Um, what I wanted to ask is, it seems like you guys come up with the ideas and then you sort of distribute them to people that are participating. I was wondering if you, if there's a sort of collaborative process where the participants are equally able to give ideas or whether that would be chaotic or how the process actually goes of like thinking of the idea, not just the implementation. Uh, let, me, let me quickly recap. So, so, so the question is what, what the creative process looks like you know, where, where does the idea originate with who and, and to what extent do other collaborators um, have input into that creative process? I love collaboration and, you know, there's a group of people who have been with them probably work for years who I go to if I have an idea or half of an idea, I like talking it out with uh, friends and collaborators. And also I just have an open door policy where anybody can email me and suggest an idea and as in the case of the Best Buy thing, and that was emailed to me by a high school kid in Texas. Um, and I, I have to look at like five bad ideas a day, um, literally, but you know, it's but twice a year I get an idea that's like, oh yeah, this is great. Like I can do something with this. So you know, using the crowd to um, to, to generate ideas is great. And um, also, when I, I like when I design things to, and um, Nick talked about this a lot as well. I like to allow the crowd to bring their own choices to it. So for Frozen Grand Central, for example, when people froze in place, I didn't micromanage and say, I want you to freeze in place this way, you do it this way, you do it this way. Everybody made all these great specific choices. One guy um, dropped a bunch of papers on the ground out of his briefcase and was like leaning to pick up papers right when he froze. A couple froze in place kissing for five minutes. And you know, I could never have like come up with 200 different actions that would have been better than what the individuals brought to it themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of it though is to, to that point is like if if you're going to do something that's going to get more complex, you just need to make sure that you can trust those collaborators. You need to like work with people that you've, you you work with a lot. Like a lot of when I do more complex work, I have a team of people that I've done this with like a hundred times. You just you just know. I mean, it's like an improv. Group. You know each other. You trust each other. You kind of know what their 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 intentions are and their and their their, their you know where they're going to gravitate. And then once you have that, you can kind of work in a natural kind of creative space. I think the only real danger is trying to do complex things with people you don't know, right? That's, that's where I would get really hesitant about like open-ended collaboration like that because especially with, with some of these, you know, like more, more transgressive events, there are things you really shouldn't do and you need to make sure other people are not gonna do those things. Um, so, so having a bit of faith in those people is gonna just be, I think, a really critical part of the collaborative process. And, and I make almost all of my work in collaboration or with, with groups of people, and I take it really seriously. Um, I am always leaning on other people for bouncing off ideas, and once I get a group of people, um, I try to, to be a good collaborator and listen and, and create space for those ideas um, and work together as a team. But there's this other part of it where often that's my piece and, and I'm a director on that piece. But the way that that plays out is, is something I learned way back when, when I was working with the Madagascar Institute early on, and that's the, this, this concept of rotating generals. So I'm going to be a general or a director on my project, but all of those people I'm working with someday are going to be a, a general as well. And it's my job at that point to go and crew on their projects. And so part of being a good collaborator for me is not just like constantly trying to pull people into my projects, but making sure that I get out and support other people in theirs, and I and I and I push them forward and push them up with with, with my skills when I whenever I can. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had a turf war with anybody. <laughs> like really, I, I don't. I can't think of a single time when I've done anything like this when I've had a turf war. To me, it's always been really, really clear. It's either my piece, and everybody's like, "Cool, it's your piece," or it's not my piece, and I don't try to own anything. I just I help out and I make it work. Uh, in, in the case of Wanderlust, um, Nathan and I are constantly scouting sites and brainstorming ideas. Um, by the time we involve any other collaborators, we have a very clear idea of why we're using a particular space, what the duration and structure of the experience is like, and sometimes in the process of thinking through stuff, we have specific other collaborators in mind. We're like, oh, Nick is going to rock puzzle design on this. And so by the time we approach Nick to do puzzle design on something, We've already designed the entire experience knowing he's going to do something in particular. So in that sense, it is a little bit like an improv group, but um, Nathan and I are, um, you know, masterminding stuff. And I, I pity anybody who tries to jump in on our creative process too early. Um, yeah. 
we had um, we, we had somebody who was um, working one of our events. It was this uh, this couples retreat at an abandoned honeymoon resort in the Poconos, and um, we one of our stewards was really bummed that we wouldn't let him wear his father's uh, 1970s era leisure suit because we, for some reason, we didn't think it went with what we were doing, even though we were kind of in this very seedy 1970s era leisure suit worthy <laughs> resort. But he ended up bringing the suit anyway and just hanging it in the closet. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Charlie mentioned uh, with the No Pants event, it kind of grew and grew and grew and somehow kind of got out of control and lost its original momentum. Um, but what about the possibility of games that don't necessarily end? Because we talked about how with like the Nightmare, there's this initiatory kind of risk, but then there's always the, uh, okay, here's the culminating moment, the dream's over, go home, we have fun. Uh, what about the possibility of games that once the rules are kind of set in place, they, that door, that kind of initial part of risk is left open and you kind of lose track of who's playing, who's not playing, what is not being played, and so it's just, you kind of let it go and let it just fire. I think that's a great idea and I'd love to sign up. You can find me after. <laughs> I, I would love to go. Uh, so, so the best example of this in games is a game called um, Assassin, which is a pretty popular college game. And Assassin, so the idea behind Assassin is that you're basically like, you're, you're, a large group of people are brought together. Uh, Franz Aliquo does a really great version of this called Street Wars. If you ever have an opportunity to play Aliquo's version, it's like the best by a mile. They'll like smuggle you down in some basement and you'll have to crawl through garbage and then find your way into this pristine office where you had to an envelope with your target. It's amazing. But everybody gets a target and everybody is being targeted by somebody. But you don't actually know how many people are playing the game and you don't know who's hunting you. So assassin games can go on for months. Like months, right? And, and you only know when it ends when the game organizers tell you, oh, everybody else is dead but you, <laughs> right? And like, I mean, that's, that's when you find out. And it's horrifying. Like, I mean, it, it really, like, destroys people's lives. Um, because you're not, you're not safe in the world. Um, yeah, Franz doesn't leave the house. Yeah, yeah, Franz. He's like the big kill, so he just doesn't leave. Yeah, he just, I mean, like, 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 Franz is amazing. I, I don't know, I get that he's a lawyer, I guess. No, no, he, does, he, does he does marketing now? Yeah, he does something where he makes a lot of money and he doesn't get away with that. But like, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's just, it's just an interesting risk. I mean, experiments have been done with this. The biggest one was uh, by actually EA, a game called Majestic, where Majestic could like fax you and call your phone and email you whenever it wanted to. And what, you, what, Majestic, what EA found out is that like, I really don't want to get a cell phone call at any time from a game. Like, I don't, I, I don't want to be in my boss's office talking to him about my project and have the game desperately call me and have me need to answer in the next 15 minutes. So I think there's like a really interesting play there, but it's, it's dangerous. And I think the only place where that has really been tried is in Scandinavia and the Nordic LARP scene. So if you're unfamiliar with the Nordic LARP scene... Um, I think we all know what you're talking about. Uh, I'll let you explore it on your own, but... Um, you, there, there, there's some fascinating, crazy stuff that goes on there. And anything you have ever thought you heard about, about putting people in crazy, crazy situations will pale in comparison to the stuff that goes on in Sweden in the winter. So, uh, I, I have a quick question. Um, something I like about doing site-specific work is that you surrender the control of having a stage. Um, uh, can you, I, I mean, Wanderlust loves that because all of our stuff is about um, the romance of, of places, especially places that are underutilized or reutilizing them in bizarre ways. Um, can, can you talk about um, how uh, losing an obvious stage has freed your work? What, what do you mean by losing? Well, I mean, like, we're sitting on a stage here, right? And we're up here, and there's, like, this clear separation between us and the audience. Um, and there's this certain kind of format that, that we're afforded by this. Um, and there's a lot of things that don't work in that format. Um, and all of you are exploring that in very different ways. Um, but, so just to get the conversation back to, to site-specific. Like, since we no longer have the traditional stage, like, what, what is the site giving you? 
And, and why, why, do you, why do you explore the site through, be it a traditional um, audience actor relationship, be it through a game space? Like what, what exactly is that site doing for you that you're losing your stage? I, I guess from a game's perspective, you don't, I don't think you ever really lose, you don't lose the stage in a real sense, right? Because what this is is a set of relationships, right? Like we, we have all like kind of implicitly agreed to a set of relationships. We are important. You are quasi-important. Right? You'll raise your hand and you'll suddenly become important for just a brief moment, like a shining star moment, and then you'll be sitting back in the nest. Um, and, and like, you know, that's, that's just a set of rules, right? It's a ritual. And, you know, I think that, you know, sociologically we always exist in these ritual contexts and we're always just redefining them. So when you make a game, you just kind of say, like, okay, we're going to just change the rules around. But they're still there. I mean, they have to be there or else we, none of us know how to behave. And by the way, um, that is a wonderful trick to get people to not do anything, is to not make it clear what they're supposed to do. I have seen that used over and over again in interactive theater, and it's so powerful. When you just like put people in a room and you don't tell them what to do, and then people just start doing things around them, they will generally freeze until they can figure out what's happening. And then they will start to act once they understand like, what the context of their action is. Um, but if you give them that context, then there are rules that apply. So I think that what a site-specific, when you're dealing with the site-specific stuff, what the site offers you, it's like an architectural rule space, right? It's like, oh, there's a door here. That means you can open that door, or that door's locked. You can't open that door. That's a constraint, right? And that defines that reality. And so I think from, from the kind of work that I do, what the site actually offers is that new, it's always a stage in the sense that there's always boundaries and relationships and, 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 uh, and affordances. And it's just a different set of affordances, and the kind of space that it is is the kind of affordances it is, which is the kind of play. I like the idea that that artists work with the with the materials that are around them. Um, we work with what, what's available to us every day. Uh, what we see, Charlie said that he walked past this this uh, this ledge every day and tried to imagine something that could be there. Um, we all have done work on the subway. Um, we, we we sort of look at at our environment and, and try to figure out ways to work within it. Um, and I think that that's sort of this that's sort of What's interesting about site-specific work, we were forced by these spaces to make something that works within them and, and, and to really respond to them and to really listen to that space. One of the things that I found out, I, I didn't really come from a theater background, um, I found out accidentally by putting on these shows the reason why we work in black boxes, right? So, so why, do, why do plays happen in black boxes? Why do plays happen in theaters? Um, because they're machines for making us pay attention. Um, a theater focuses all of our attention on a stage. We're looking at a proscenium. People are, are raised up, light is pointed at them. All of these things uh, blot out the rest of the world and make us focus on this one thing. So suddenly if we're doing work in, in the real world, work without a stage, we have to figure out ways to sort of engage that machine again. and and. When we're doing that, we're, we start solving problems. We start working with the real world and trying to figure out how we can make these spaces work for us and for our audiences. And I think that that's one of the places where site-specific work becomes really interesting. It's the way that, that, we, that we solve those problems and the way that the audience can see those problems being solved. I agree. <laughs> I think for me, uh, I find that my mind likes a groove, and my life likes to find a groove. And, you know, the mind is a swift flowing river that very quickly cuts a channel. And uh, any any site um, that I, any site that I can wrap around myself is a thing that gets me up out of that channel, and that's really important to like being awake because there's something to to me when you get in the groove that feels like you're, you're moving through the world just as a lump of meat. Um, yeah, one question here. Yes, hi. Um, you also talking about site-specific as space, or try to be the best as a typical space. And I'm not sure if you're being involved virtual. Can you talk a little about virtual sites? Also, the relationship between site and situation. Because uh, the other two, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, work a little more with, with maybe orchestrating or staging situations rather than thinking about 
Yeah. One, one question at a time. No, no more. <laughs> so, so, so the, 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 the meat of the question, as I understand it, is um, what's, what's the distinction between site and situation? Um, and to what extent is creating situations part of, part of the work? There was also a, a note about virtual spaces. And, and here we have Jeff, Charlie, and Nick. Oh man, I was making, I was gonna have so much fun calling the, the guy with the hat and the other guy without the hat. We're gonna call, we're gonna call him Chris. <laughs> I, um, to answer the virtual question, I don't really do anything in virtual spaces and people have suggested ideas to me. And I, and I think it's interesting, but it's just not, um, not really the style of the property where I like using the internet to get people to leave their computers and do something in the, in the real world. So that's my focus. Virtual spaces are different because physics don't necessarily apply. So when someone enters a virtual space, you don't actually know what the rules are, right? So if I, if I hand you a controller and I say, hey, play this game, the first thing you do is you hit the buttons to figure out what happens. Because A doesn't always mean jump, sometimes A means sprint, right? So you just don't know. So that's a very different kind of relationship to the world. And I think that I think that exploration in that space is very different for that reason, right? You, you, like the world just has affordances that are just true. There will be gravity, light works a certain way, I have a body and I, my body's gonna respond a certain way, other people have bodies. All that stuff is true and oh by the way, there are actual consequences to everything I do so I'm not gonna suddenly hit Jeff in the face, right? Cause, but like in a game I might, in a virtual space cause I don't, you know, I don't think I'm gonna get arrested. So, it's, it's a different kind of thing, and I honestly, I love digital stuff, and I got no problem with kids sitting in front of computers all day, um, but I don't think that that taps into the kind of emotional reality that we're talking about here in the same way. I can have amazing moments in digital spaces and, and ecstatic, transcendent moments in digital spaces. Watch the sunset in Minecraft, just watch the sunset. And it, it, it's, it's, it's transcendent, right? Um, but, I don't think you get the same kind of, you don't get these sort of, these really, the same transgressive realities, you don't get the same kind of relationships. And I guess in terms of situation, it's like, you know, five people, five people in a room is politics, so anytime you've got more than one person doing something, you automatically have that social set of relationships, and like I said before, I think that those things have to be defined or else people get confused. So I think there is a context for this kind of stuff. I think it's often very subtly done, which is what's magical about it, right? Like, I'm sure that, you know, I, I think, and I think this is interesting. It's an interesting difference between between your work, right? Because since your work is working with incidental people, you're sort of redefining their spaces for them. Whereas your work is taking people into spaces that, that in some sense, you're going to share a definition of. And I guess I'm curious about the difference between those things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's. I mean, I think it's what I was talking about earlier, just with the fact that. The people who are participating, I could never charge a ticket price because the people are the event. Um, so, but, I mean, to answer the question about the situation or the distinction of that, like, I, I feel like there have been a lot of events where the idea of the situation has come first, and then I figure out this, the site that is best for that. So, the idea is, wouldn't it be cool if time stopped and a bunch of people froze in place? Well, where would be a great place for that to be expressed? Where? the most people could be impacted and it would be the best contrast. Well, maybe a busy train station where people are rushing to catch their train and, and it would be a, you know, the most striking contrast would do it there. And I guess I'm interested in both. I mean, you know, looking at Charlie's work and, and I very directly called and asked Charlie for help on projects in the past. I really do ask anyone for ideas. Um, Charlie helped me sort of focus in on um, how important it is to um, make people aware of their own watching, right? And so one of the ways that we, we do this, um, and it happens in almost all of the Improv Everywhere videos, is that the Improv Everywhere videos focus on um, one person and that person's reaction. So when you see it in that, that very early, you know, the, the woman reading the rape book, um, the camera is on her, the camera is not on the guys uh, in, in, in the underwear. Um, and so I sort of, um, I became very aware that to, to, to organize projects and to bring audiences in, um, one of the things to do as, as, a, um, as a, a, a director or as a maker is to focus on the, that audience and, and 
and let the audience look at the other audience looking at that work as well. So it's like if I've got an audience uh, watching a play on the subway, um, that audience is also being watched by a secondary audience that's sort of on the other platform looking at them across the way. So we're looking at different <coughs> ways of looking, and I think it's a, it's a, a, a way to, that's sort of different than a normal theatrical work. Maybe the theater in the round sometimes does that. Well, that's a great note to wrap up on. Um, next week, we are gonna go into documentation and legacy. So what does that secondary audience look like, and what can you actually offer them? Um, uh, please um, stick around, uh, get drinks, keep discussing, um, come. We, we know you have a lot more questions. We're gonna have all of these three gentlemen uh, hang, hang out back by the bar, so you're welcome to uh, hang out and uh, ask them questions and get their phone numbers. And, uh, and uh, I have one final announcement, which is um, there's a little thing that may be happening later in the week, and if you would be interested in doing something you probably shouldn't be doing, then you might want to talk to Jeff, the man in the hat, about it. I don't recommend it, but um, he might be doing something at some point. So. You can also talk to Nathan, the man in the hat. So you can come to either Jeff or I and uh, talk to us about some trouble that you might want to get into if you would like to be arrested. Um, oh, can I, can I plug as long as we're plugging? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, come out and plays next month. And it's free. So you can show up. Yeah, and it's uh, the 12th oh, yeah. and 13th. And on the 14th. July. And on the 14th, my MP3 tournament project, uh, all are welcome. Download the file on the website in July and participate. Thank you guys so much for. Thank you all for coming.